Hey, welcome, my name is Bill Butler. I'm the president of the Black Rock Historical Society. I welcome you to our 2020 speaker series. The Black Rock Historical Society is chartered by the Regents of the University of the State of New York as an educational organization where we celebrate and preserve the story of historic Black Rock and the continuing history of our Northwest Buffalo communities. I wish to thank our speaker series program manager, Janine Barron, for organizing this year's agenda of interesting and thought-provoking speakers. Thank you for joining us, and I encourage you to check our website and our YouTube channel for a complete list of speakers. We are sorry you cannot be here with us, but please feel free to email your questions and comments to us. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's presentation, Rick Falkowski. Rick Falkowski has been involved in all aspects of Western New York entertainment during the past 50 years. He is the founder of the Buffalo Music Hall of Fame and Buffalo Music Awards, former publisher of Buffalo Backstage Magazine, entertainment coordinator of Tonawanda's Gateway Harbor Concerts, former representative of the American Society of Authors, Composers, and Publishers, and a Time Warner retiree. He presents classes on the history of Buffalo music and entertainment and Buffalo history for the Erie County Department of Senior Services University Express Program along with giving presentations at libraries, community centers, and for various organizations. In addition, Rick is a columnist for Forever Young magazine, author of the book History of Buffalo Music and Entertainment in October 2019, released his second book, Profiles Volume 1, Historic and Influential People from Buffalo and Western New York, the 1800s. Rick is currently researching conducting and compiling information for his next two books, Growing Up in the Baby Boom Generation and Profiles Volume 2, Historic and Influential People from Buffalo and Western New York, the 1900s, scheduled for publication in 2021. We welcome Rick Falkowski. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. This is uh, something that feels brand new. Last time I gave a talk was uh, back on March 11th pre-pandemic, you know, so today's like uh, the first time in six months that I'm uh, giving a talk in front of people, okay, and also in front of cameras, you know, so if I screw anything up, you know, it's because I'm a little rusty, or it could be dementia, I'm not sure, it could be one or the other, well, anyways, you know, I'm really glad to be here today to uh, talk about my new book uh, called Historic and Influential People from Buffalo and Western New York. Today I'm going to be concentrating on the early history part of that book. So today I'm going to be talking about the uh, building of the Buffalo Harbor, the War of 1812, the building of the Erie Canal, all the early residents, and also putting in a lot of information on developments from uh, the Black Rock area. As with all the presentations that I give, I always have three objectives. Number one is to remind you of things that you may have forgotten. Number two is to tell you about things that you didn't know. And number three, most important in my mind, is to make you proud to be from Buffalo in Western New York. To create the setting for today's talk, since we're in Black Rock, here's Black Rock, 200 years ago. Look how peaceful it looks. With the pandemic today, it's not that peaceful today. Well, any anyways, you know, just bringing us into Black Rock. You look outside and you still see the water and everything like that, so. Okay, prior to the arrival of the Europeans in the Western New York area, the uh, state of New York was uh, populated by the Haudenosaunee, which we know better as the uh, people of the Longhouse or the Iroquois. This map shows how the state was diversified with the Six Nations going across the state. In the area of Western New York itself, there were three separate tribes, the Wenro, the Neutrals, and the Erie. There was a battle called, uh, not a battle, really a war, called the Beaver Wars that were fought between different uh, Native American tribes as to who was going to sell furs and beavers to the Europeans, the English and the French. And the Seneca ended up defeating the Wenro in 1643, the Neutrals in 1650, and the Erie in 1653, giving them control of the Western New York area. Most of the people from these tribes were assimilated into the Seneca. And uh, there was an area where they built a uh, village at Little Rapid Village, that's what the French called it. And it's a very good chance that where they built their first village in the Western New York area was right here, Black Rock, because uh, that's where the rapids are in uh, the Niagara River. 
And during the American Revolution, there was something called the Scorched Earth Policy of General Sullivan. What the Americans ended up doing is burning the villages of the Haudenosaunee tribes that, in the Finger Lakes that were affiliated with the English. That made the Seneca move to the western New York area and set up the Buffalo Creek Reservation, which is the reason why we have our casino in downtown Buffalo, the Buffalo Creek Reservation Casino. Uh, the French were the first European power to come to the western New York area. Samuel Champlain had explored Lake Ontario. He wrote about Niagara Falls, but he never came here. And LaSalle had visited the area and returned in December 1678. And his reason for coming was to build a ship so he could explore the western Great Lakes. With him, he brought Father Hennepin. Father Hennepin was the first European to write about Niagara Falls. And when Hennepin saw the falls, as fantastic as the falls are today, they were even better then because there was twice as much water going over Niagara Falls than there is today. Because right now, half the water is siphoned off for hydroelectric power. And uh, he started uh, building the Griffin on Cayuga Island, north of uh, where the Niagara Falls are today. They started building that and they finished it in May, launching it into the river, but it took them all the way from May until August to get the uh, Griffin all the way to the mouth of Lake Erie because of the strong currents of Niagara. In fact, I've read in some places that in Unity Island, right here in the Black Rock area, they stopped and did extra work on the ship to be able to complete it before it went out into the Great Lakes. After the ship was launched, unfortunately, it was lost on its first voyage and the wreck was never found. Jean Kier is actually three separate people, the father and his two sons. Thomas the father arrived in North America in 1687, and shortly after he got into North America, he was captured by the Seneca. And they were about to torture him when he broke loose, and he punched the Seneca chief in the face and broke his nose. You'd think that would get him in trouble. No, the Seneca had respect for him for fighting for himself. So he was adopted into the Seneca tribe, and he came to the Western New York area, and he built a trading post in Lewiston in 1719, which is now on the grounds of our park. And in 1726, he got permission to build what he called the House of Peace. That way, the Seneca wouldn't say, gee, that's a fort. And we called the House of Peace, and that became the French castle inside of Fort Niagara. In 1750, his son Daniel ended up taking over the portage, going from Lewiston to above the falls. And he ended up building Little Fort Niagara above the falls. And you can see the chimney over here. When you're driving to Niagara Falls, that chimney is still there today. That was built by Jean Pierre all the way back in uh, 1758. In 1758, he also built a settlement in Buffalo. And this wasn't some little small settlement. It said several buildings, fields that were cultivated and everything like that. And where it was located is near where the General Mills plant is today. In fact, if you're ever going to Riverworks for any activities, you'll end up seeing the sign right there on the side of the uh, General Mills building. Well, when the French lost the French and Indian War, that ended their power right here in the West New York and Niagara Peninsula. The British didn't really have any settlements in the Western New York area until they won the French and Indian War. At that time, they were given Fort Niagara for ended up winning the war, and they wanted a fort on the other side of the Niagara River. So they ended up building Fort Erie. And here's two pictures, one a view from uh, what the fort was like looking out, uh, probably going over towards uh, Wilkinson Point, and the other one looking from Buffalo over towards the fort. The problem, they ended up building the fort right on the water. They weren't familiar with the Western New York winters. They didn't know about the blizzard of 77. You know, that fort continually got destroyed by ice and storms and wind, and they kept moving it higher and higher up on the ridge until the fort is where it is today. The English also continued running the portage from Lewiston to now Fort Slosher. And it was the British policy of stopping the Seneca from assisting with the portage that was partially responsible for the Devil's Hole Massacre 
which was led by Seneca warrior Farmer's Brother. During the French and Indian War in 1755, Farmer's Brother actually fought for the British, and Corn Planter appointed him to lead a group of 300 warriors during Pineax Rebellion in 1763. That was an attempt by the Indian nations in America to drive the British out of the Great Lakes area. Well, with his warriors, he ended up burning three forts in Pennsylvania. One of them forts was Erie, Pennsylvania. And on September 14th of 1763, he led the Devil's Hole Massacre, which is right where Devil's Hole is today on the Niagara Gorge. He attacked John Stedman's wagon train, forcing the wagons into the Niagara Gorge. Some British troops ended up hearing all the commotion and they came to the rescue. No, no good, you know, Farmer's Brother is too good of a warrior. The British ended up losing 21 Teamsters, 81 soldiers, and to show you how good of a warrior Farmer's Brother was, there was one wounded Seneca. At the Treaty of uh, Canandaigua in 1794 and Geneseo in 1797, Farmer's Brother was uh, one of the people that ended up signing away a lot of the Indians' land. Now, where'd he get his name? Well, George Washington was giving a speech in 1792, and he was telling the Seneca that he was a farmer, and the farm, a farmer is a noble profession, such as my brother, and he pointed over to Farmer's Brother. And he was so excited to have met George Washington that he ended up taking it as his name, Farmer's Brother, which ended up sticking with him for the rest of his life. Interesting point, he led the Senecas for the Americans during the War of 1812. It's not sure when Farmer's Brother was born. He was at least 80 years old when he was the commander of the Seneca troops, but it's possible that he was as old as 100 years old when he was leading him in the battle. And he was uh, buried with honors at the Franklin Square Cemetery and moved to uh, Forest Lawn. Well, William Johnson was the Indian agent for the British Army. He arrived at Fort Niagara in 1780. There's a drawing that shows basically what Fort Niagara looked like uh, in 1780. And he was assigned as the Indian agent to the Seneca at Buffalo Creek. And when the British ended up leaving Fort Niagara in 1794, after they lost the American Revolution, he ended up deciding to stay because he loved living with the Seneca. He married a Seneca and he built a trading post. And he was given land by the Seneca, which included most of what included in the entire initial village of Buffalo. He later agreed to trade that land with Ellicott and the Holland Land Company, because if he wouldn't have traded, the mouth of the Buffalo River would not have been in the village of Buffalo. Now, other early residents in the Buffalo area are shown on uh, this slide. In fact, uh, with Johnson coming here in 1780, Cornelius Winnie was uh, built a trading post in uh, 1783, and uh, Martin Middlebauer and his son Ezekiel Lane also had a house. That was the first three houses that were in the entire Buffalo Creek or Western New York area. And then John Palmer opened a tavern. Can't have Buffalo without a tavern. You know, they probably already sold chicken wings all the way back then. And uh, Black Joe Hodge was an escaped slave who ended up living in the Buffalo area and he was fluent in several different Seneca dialects and he would lead expeditionary trips into the Ohio Territory for people that came to the Buffalo area. Salinius Maybe also had a trading post here. Asa Ransom was a silversmith who traded with uh, the Haudenosaunee and the Finger Lakes also moved here. And of course, the most important person in town was William Robbins. The blacksmith is really what the entire village, you know, was all about. This was the entire male-led population of the Buffalo area in 17, 98. That was soon all to change. Joseph Ellicott was a surveyor and agent for the Holland Land Company. He first visited Buffalo in 1789 when he measured the length of the Niagara River. And he was hired in 1797 to ascertain the boundaries of what the Holland Land Company had purchased. 
It's then when he negotiated with William Johnson about changing the southern boundary. As you can see on the map on the far right hand side, originally William Street went straight this way to uh, Lake Erie. That was the end of the Holland Land Company territory. They ended up negotiating that it ended up going down this way to the Buffalo Creek. That way the mouth of the creek was inside of the Holland Land Company territory and uh, Buffalo Creek uh, Reservation ended up being south of it. If he wouldn't have made that trade, Buffalo wouldn't have had a uh, harbor. And in 1798, he returned to start and survey the lands, and he worked with a guy named William Peacock to lay out the city into inner and outer lots, which you can see on the two maps that are on the left. The real big lot, one number 104, is where Ellicott planned on building his home. He ended up deciding not being there. He ended up going out to uh, Clarence with uh, Asa Ransom and eventually to Batavia. He was assisted by his brother, Benjamin. And Benjamin ended up getting a deal of a lifetime. Okay, he ended up buying 300 acres of land around the area where Ellicott Creek has what's now called Glen Falls. He got that for $2 an acre. So he paid $6,000 for the entire village of Williamsville. That's about the same as I pay per year on my modest home in Williamsville right now. And he got the whole village for that uh, $6,000. You know, both Joseph and Benjamin purchased land in other areas, including very valuable waterfront property. But neither Joseph nor Benjamin had any children. So they didn't have any heirs. They ended up leaving their estates to their sisters, along with their sister's children and their sister's grandchildren. But the three Ellicott sisters all married men from the Evans family. Hmm, a little odd, three people marrying three people from the other family. That's why you, Ellicott's all over the place. You got Ellicott Creek, Ellicott Park, you know, but you really don't have people named Ellicott around. That's because they were carried on by the Evans family. William Evans developed the Evans Slip on the waterfront. David became resident agent of the Holland Land Company after uh, Joseph was uh, let go. And Charles Evans actually married Mary Peacock, who was the niece of William Peacock, who ended up laying out the city with Joseph Ellicott. He expanded the Evans Slip on uh, the harbor and worked with Robert Dunbar to establish flour mills and brick mills in the Buffalo Harbor. He even wrote the history of the Ellicott and the Evans families. As we mentioned before, Asa Ransom was one of the very first settlers of Buffalo in 1797. That year, his daughter, Sophia, was born. She was the first white child born in Western New York, outside of Fort Niagara. In 1799, he moved to Clarence, and he also got that great offer of $2 per acre, and ended up buying uh, most of the area of Clarence, where if he operated a tavern, he ended up getting that low price. And in 1799, he moved there, and his son, Harry Bolton Ransom, was born. He was the first male child born in the Western New York area. Ransom also became the first white official in uh, Western New York when he was uh, named Justice of the Peace. And his brother Elias had a tavern on the other side of where Williamsville was. And his stepbrother was Timothy Hopkins. The Hopkins family is very prominent in the Western New York area and he was the first supervisor of Amherst in 1819. Now Red Jacket was probably the most famous person in the Buffalo Creek area when the town was formed. He was a great chief and a great orator for the Seneca Nation. Now where did he get his name? During the American Revolution, he was a messenger for the British and they gave him a red jacket to wear. So he named himself, American name became Red Jacket. In 1792, he was given a peace medal, which you can see in the top right hand corner by George Washington. And he always wore that, and he would not allow his portrait to be painted without that medal. And he was the Seneca representative at the Big Tree Treaty in 1797. He disagreed with giving up Indian land, and he disagreed with all the Seneca being forced to move to reservations, but he was overruled. Eventually, he felt concessions were required to work with the white man. However, he argued for retaining Indian tradition, and he was not in favor of Christianity because uh, Native Americans should have kept their own religion. In fact, when his wife converted to Christianity, Red Jacket kicked her out of the house. 
In 1801, there's a famous full, uh, painting here on the left side. Red Jacket was accused of witchcraft by Handsome Lake and Corn Planer. In the Seneca Nation, if you were accused of witchcraft and you were found guilty, the penalty was death. Red Jacket defended himself in one of his great orations and remained the leader of the Seneca Nation. He was buried in uh, South Buffalo at the Seneca Mission Indian Cemetery, which uh, still stands on Buffin Street because it was saved by John Larkin from the Larkin uh, Soap Company because he considered that sacred land. And then he was reburied at Forest Lawn Cemetery in a place of honor. When you come into Forest Lawn today, the first thing that greets you is Red Jacket's uh, statue. Sorinius Chapin was the first doctor to practice medicine in the Buffalo area. In 1801, Chapin came to Buffalo with 40 settlers, and he said, we want to buy the land at the mouth of the Buffalo River or the Buffalo Creek. Joseph Ellicott turned him down. They were willing to buy the whole thing because he hadn't as yet you know, laid out the, all the lots. And he returned two years later in uh, 1803, and the lots still weren't available. So what did he do? He ended up building himself a home in Fort Erie up in Canada across the Niagara River. And from there, he serviced patients both in Canada and the United States. He was finally able to purchase a lot in Buffalo in 1805. When the War of 1812 broke out, Chapin, even though he was a doctor, also ended up becoming a colonel, and he led raids into Canada. And on December 30th of 1813, the British had crossed the Niagara River and they attacked Black Rock. Chapin tried to protect it, but a bunch of his uh, soldiers all mutinied and ended up coming back to Buffalo. He then set up a cannon on the corner of Main and Niagara Streets to try to hold back the British from burning down the city of Buffalo after they burned Black Rock. But unfortunately, after several volleys, the cannon broke down and he surrendered. Well, English commander General Ryle did not accept Chapin's surrender. Why? He wasn't the commanding officer. So Chapin might not have saved Buffalo from being burned by the British, but he did give time for the people of the Buffalo area to be able to escape and get to either Hamburg or to Williamsville. And when you hear about Buffalo being burned, how big was Buffalo back then? Well, check out these maps on the right-hand side. The entire village of Buffalo was really from Exchange Street to Chippewa and Franklin to Washington. So it really wasn't all that big. Okay, Margaret St. John talked the British and the Indians into not burning her house down. In fact, her home was the only home not destroyed during the burning of Buffalo. And the St. John family originally came to the Buffalo area in 1807. And in uh, 1810, they ended up buying this property at 640 Main Street, where they also had a tavern where they ended up you know, serving the people of the Buffalo area. When a British attack started, her son-in-law gathered his wife and six younger St. John children into his wagon. He tried to flee to Williamsville, couldn't make it. So he ended up going to Hamburg and he said he would be back. He didn't make it back. So Margaret and her two older daughters ended up being stranded inside of the house. In fact, at night, Sarah, one of the daughters, would sneak out of the house and forage for food, catching chickens and pigs and stealing vegetables just so they had something to eat. Across the street from Margaret St. John was the home of Mrs. Sarah Lovejoy. Now, she also argued with the English about saving her home. Unfortunately, she was killed by the uh, Mohawks that were helping the English. She was the only female killed during the burning of Buffalo. And her home across the street from uh, St. John House is where the uh, Tift House later was and later the location of Hangers. 
and uh, the St. John family was well respected by the people of Buffalo. And their home, a picture of it right there, actually stood until 1871 when it was finally torn down. Because by then, it was in the middle of downtown Buffalo. Erastus Granger was a friend of Thomas Jefferson, and he received political posts when he arrived in Buffalo in 1803. He was appointed the Superintendent of Indian Affairs, Collector of Customs at the Buffalo Harbor, and the Postmaster. He ended up buying a 700-acre farm picture of which you can see there, which was four miles from the city. It was called Flint Hill. And upon these grounds was the sacred Seneca site called Consul in the Oaks. And here he met with Red Jacket, Farmer's Brother, and Corn Planter, asking them to remain neutral during the War of 1812. But when the Mohawks ended up joining the British, the Seneca ended up joining the Americans. Four miles away from downtown Buffalo. That was too far away for the British to burn his uh, farm when they uh, burned Buffalo. In fact, his farm was sold and it became Forest Lawn Cemetery. And part of it became Delaware Park. Now, William Hodge ended up coming to the Buffalo area in 1805. And he settled at the corner of Maine and Utica. And there he opened a tavern, which was the uh, last tavern in the Buffalo area before you went out towards Williamsville, called the Brick Tavern on the Hill. And uh, after his tavern, you had to go all the way to Elias Ransom's and Timothy Hopkins Tavern, two miles uh, west of Williamsville. In the winter of 1812 and 1813, which was one of the coldest winters of all time, the American troops ended up camping on Flint Hill. That winter, 300 soldiers died. Now, most of these soldiers died, believe it or not, from dysentery or diarrhea, not from wounds. And they were originally buried without coffins in the ground at Flint Hill. But due to the stone strata that's really close to the surface there, when the snow started melting, there were arms and legs sticking out of the soil. And this was terrible. So there was, the next door neighbor to them was Dr. Daniel Chapin, no relation to Serenius Chapin, and he ended up paying Hodge to build 300 coffins for the soldiers to be properly buried, where they were buried in the meadow, where the sign is right here, in Delaware Park. So if you're ever in Delaware Park, there is an area where there's a stone which marks where 300 American heroes were buried during the war, right here in Delaware Park. Well, Hodge and his next door neighbor, Abner Bryant, were the people that planted all the elm trees on the west side of Buffalo until they were destroyed by the uh, Dutch Elm disease many, many years later. Okay, right here in the Black Rock area, in fact, in a picture that was uh, painted by director uh, Dorian Boyer de Booth, Major Ludwig Morgan was the hero of the Battle of Conjuncta Creek. Everybody knows Conjuncta Creek. Well, you do now, because now it's called Skajakwita Creek. Well, anyways, after the Battle of Lundy's Lane, the Americans fell back to Fort Erie and to the city of Buffalo. The British decided to try to cut off the supplies so they could take back Fort Erie. Well, Morgan had a force of 240 men, and they had to protect this against what would be a much larger British force if they ended up crossing the Niagara River. There was one bridge which ended up going over, well, Skajakwita Creek. We'll forget about Conjuncta. And that was uh, actually near where Topps Market is, not far from uh, the Sportsman's. And every night they would take all the planks out of the bridge. So if the British came, they wouldn't be able to get across to the other side of the creek. Well, one day the British finally came across and sure enough, they started coming across the bridge with no planks in there. They were perfect, you know, for the American sharpshooters to end up picking them off or the other ones ended up falling into the creek. So the Americans were outnumbered by five to one, but they ended up holding the British back. Now, why was this important? If the British would have won, possibly they would have burned Black Rock again. 
possibly they would have burned the city of Buffalo again. And this could have changed the entire outcome of the War of 1812. Unfortunately for Major Morgan, a hero one day, 10 days later, he was killed by a sharpshooter during the Battle of Fort Erie. So unfortunately, he never got to shine in the glory of what he accomplished. Also right here in the Black Rock area, this is where Commodore Perry rebuilt some ships that ended up taking part in the uh, Battle of Lake Erie. He ended up rebuilding three ships, but he couldn't take them up the Niagara River until the Americans had captured uh, Fort Erie. And once that was captured in July of 1813, he towed the ships by oxen to the mouth of uh, Lake Erie and they took place in the battle. Unfortunately, when Black Rock and Buffalo were burned in December, three of the ships that participated in the Battle of Lake Erie were also destroyed. Person that ended up living in the Black Rock area, Peter Bull Porter. He was a politician, War of 1812 general. He was the voice of Black Rock in making Black Rock the western terminus of the Erie Canal. And with his brother Augustus, he owned a portage around the falls. In 1805, there was a strip of one mile all along the uh, Niagara River that was ceded by the Senecas. It was called the Mile Reserve. Well, they put this up for sale, and they also put leases up for Lewiston and Fort Slosher. Well, they ended up buying a portage, and they ended up got the leases for uh, Lewiston and Slosher, and they formed a company called Porter Barton and Company along with Benjamin Barton. So they ended up moving all the goods from Lake Ontario over to Lake Erie. After they started the business, uh, Barton ended up staying in Lewiston. Augustus Porter moved to the Niagara Falls area, which was then called Manchester, and Peter Porter moved to Black Rock and was elected to the House of Representatives. During the War of 1812, he was a general and he fought in many of the battles. And at the end of the war, he was named commander of all the American forces. And Fort Porter, just a little ways down the road, was named after him in 1841. It was on the Niagara River, just near where the entrance to the Peace Bridge is today. And in 1816, he built this home right on Niagara Street, which he ended up later selling to Lewis Allen, which we'll talk about in a little while. In 1836, he ended up moving to Niagara Falls, and his grandson, Peter A. Porter, owned an Niagara Gazette and a Cataract House, a famous hotel that was in the Falls area. He was also in the House of Representatives, and he was a family member of the Porter family. In 1885, when they sold Niagara Falls and much of the surrounding land, including Goat Island, to New York State for building the first state park in the United States. As I said, Benjamin Barton remained in Lewiston when they started the company, and he ended up building this mansion which still stands on the corner of Center and 3rd Street in Lewiston. Well, William A. Byrd's uncle was Peter Porter. And Byrd was an engineer, and since Porter lived right here in Black Rock, he ended up moving to the uh, Black Rock area after he worked for the government in uh, Western United States. In 1820, he built this house at 1118 Niagara Street, where he lived for the next 58 years. When they were digging the cellar for this house, they ended up finding 12 skeletons inside of a kettle. And each one of these skeletons had a tomahawk in their skull. It's believed that they were French explorers who went missing while traveling to Detroit in 1863. Well, Byrd was responsible for building the Black Rock Harbor, laying out many of the streets of the Black Rock area. And with Porter, he started the Buffalo Black Rock Railroad, which was the first railroad in the Buffalo area. Originally, it was horse-drawn cars, which came as far as Black Rock, until he replaced them with steam engines and extended the tracks all the way to Niagara Falls. He was also the founder of the Erie County Savings Bank, which uh, he was president of for 24 years until his death. Now, Samuel Wilkinson, you could say, is the builder of Buffalo. He moved to Buffalo during the War of 1812, 
after building ships for the U.S. Navy, and he was the first Justice of the Peace of the area in 1815. Wilkinson argued for Buffalo to be the western terminus of the Erie Canal, going up against Peter Porter, who argued for Black Rock. Well, Wilkinson ended up forming the Buffalo Harbor Company with Ebenezer Johnson, Ebenezer Walden, Charles Townsend, George Coit, and Oliver Forward. They removed the sandbar that blocks the mouth of the Buffalo River by moving the mouth of the river a thousand feet to the south, and they built a pier going a thousand feet out into the lake. By getting the sandbar removed, Buffalo received the designation as the western terminus of the Erie Canal because ships could now enter the river. In fact, he built a home, which you can see right here, which was on Niagara Square and was later the location of City Hall. If it were not for Wilkeson, we may be called the City of Black Rock. And today, the Black Rock Bills would be playing football instead of the Buffalo Bills. Dr. Ebenezer Johnson was the first mayor of the city of Buffalo. He came here in 1809 to practice medicine, but he didn't know Serenius Chapin had already set up a practice here. So he fled to Williamsville when Buffalo was burned to uh, treat the wounded soldiers at the hospital that was put there on Garrison Road. And he then returned to Buffalo and opened a drugstore, invested in real estate, and started working along with Wilkeson on harbor development and shipping. In fact, Wilkinson and Johnson ended up building the Dam and Toll Bridge, which established both Tonawanda and North Tonawanda when the Erie Canal came to that area. And he was also the mayor of Buffalo in 1832. And in 32, there was the cholera epidemic, and his medical degree ended up coming in hand. He set up a hospital, and he issued a decree for immediate burial of the dead and placed a quarantine on the city stopping a lake, canal, and stagecoach traffic. Sounds like what we ended up doing with the pandemic here, doesn't it? <laughs> and he also purchased a lot on Delaware Avenue that was between Chippewa and Tracy. And this is one of the first great mansions built on Delaware Avenue called Johnson Cottage. George Coit worked along with Wilkinson and Johnson, and Coit and Charles Townsend moved to Buffalo all the way back in 1811 when they ended up opening a drugstore on uh, the corner of Swan and Pearl, not far from where the Pearl Street Pub is today. And uh, they ended up selling that in 1818 to enter the shipping industry and build the Buffalo Harbor. The Coit Slip was one of the most important slips, and right now it's behind Templeton Landing. And the commercial slip is where the warehouse was. That's now on the uh, ground where the Naval Park Museum stands. The frieze you can see there in the bottom, the Wedding of the Waters, that's uh, up on uh, the side of the building at the Buffalo History Museum. That shows DeWitt Clinton with Coit, Townsend, and Wilkeson emptying waters from Lake Erie into the New York Harbor. They ended up traveling the canal on a barge called the Seneca Chief. Who owned that? George Coit. Okay, Coit built a house for himself in 1815 on Pearl Street which was moved in 1867 to Virginia near Elmwood. That house is still there. There's a picture of the original house and there's a picture I recently took of the house today. It's the oldest house that exists in the Western New York area. Mortisee Noah was only in Buffalo for one day, but he deserves to be mentioned when we talk about early people that were important for the Western New York area. He attempted to set up the city of Ararat on Grand Island as a home for the Jews. In 1820, he got New York State to approve the idea of purchasing Grand Island to be a Jewish state for oppressed Jewish people scattered all around the world. He spent five years trying to raise the money and in 1825 purchased 2,555 acres of land on Grand Island. He was gonna have a big celebration for uh, the opening of it and he had this fantastic plaque made to commemorate the occasion. But unfortunately, sufficient ships could not be found to be able to take people from the area where we are now, here in uh, Black Rock, over to uh, Grand Island. So uh, the ceremony was held at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. And there was a parade from the courthouse, which is now where the library is, and a reception at the uh, Eagle Tavern. 
Noah asked for every Jew to contribute three shackles, or one dollar a year, to assist in defraying the cost of establishing the settlement. Jews in America did not heed the call. They didn't move to Grand Island or Ararat. And the rabbis in Europe did not support the idea. So it was all forgotten by 1825. The cornerstone was propped up against the cathedral for years and years, and it's now inside of the uh, Buffalo History Museum. And no one never even stepped foot in Grand Island. His land ended up being sold to the lumber company that Lewis Allen worked for. But can you imagine how different Western New York would be today if our route was established as a home for Jewish people of the world? And also later, on Navy Island, that was almost a home for the United Nations. So we must have the United, United Nations also on uh, the Grand Island area. Buffalo would have been a lot different than it is today. Or maybe we'd still be called Black Rock. <laughs> Who knows? It was Lewis Allen that ended up coming to Buffalo to work for an insurance company in 1827. In 1829, he bought 29 acres of land along Main Street. Every morning, he would take his herd of cows and walk the cows over to a pasture in Days Park. The path that he walked them down became Allen Street. And uh, he ended up going to work for the East Boston Lumber Company of Massachusetts, which ended up buying a lot of the land from uh, Noah. They ended up purchasing all 16,000 acres of Grand Island for $6 an acre, but they did it to be able to cut down the white oak trees. After the project was done, he purchased 600 of those acres for his farm called Allenton, where he did research on planting and milk production, and he planted a whole bunch of fruit orchards. He started a private club called Falconwood, which became Beaver Island State Park. And in 1841, the bottom picture, he restarted the Erie County Fair behind the courthouse at Niagara Square. The Erie County Fair, other than not having the event this year, has continued ever since Allen restarted it. In 1837, he ended up purchasing the home of Peter Porter on Niagara Street, where he lived for 50 years. His nephew, Grover Cleveland, came and visited him at this house on Niagara Street. And he told his uncle he was on his way to Ohio because he wanted to become an attorney. Well, Alan said, you can study law right here in Western New York. You don't have to go to Ohio. He says, go talk to my attorney. Well, the next day, Cleveland went over to Alan's attorney's office and says he'd like to study there as a clerk to learn law. And they said to him, sorry, we don't have any room. There's no openings for us to have a clerk. Well, the next morning, Alan found out about this. He was livid. And he ended up going over to his attorney's office and he says, my nephew was here and you told him there were no openings for him to be a clerk. If you do not need him, you don't need my law business. Well, long story short, they ended up hiring Cleveland. He studied law there. He became an attorney. He got involved with politics and he was elected president of the United States. There's always a cog in everything, isn't there? Well, Allen was the chairman of the Republican Party for Erie County. Cleveland was a Democrat. They ended up parting ways because of their views. In fact, Allen never voted for his nephew in an election. Talk about party lines. It's even worse than it is today with the election coming up here. Okay, Millard Fillmore ended up moving to the Western New York area at age 21 with his parents. They lived in East Aurora, and he ended up leaving there to teach at the Cold Spring School, which was near the corner of Maine and Utica. And he also studied law in a downtown uh, law firm. He ended up marrying Abigail Powers, who was his teacher, and he built her this home on Main Street, which was next door to the, where the Aurora Theater is today. His law office was across the street from the home. What's across the street from the Aurora Theater? Oh, Viddler's 5 and 10. So Fillmore's first law office was inside of where Viddler's 5 and 10 is today. His law practice ended up growing and he ended up buying this house at 180 uh, Franklin Street. And he kept the house when he was elected vice president when Zachary Taylor was president. Well, unfortunately, Zachary Taylor died and he became president. Fillmore signed the controversial Compromise of 1850, which included the Fugitive Slave Act. Many people held this against him and he was not nominated for another term. However, in retrospect, 
He was partially responsible for the North winning the Civil War. Because if the Fugitive Slave Act would not have been signed, the North would not have been able to develop industry and might have lost the Civil War. Things would be a lot different and not very nice if the South would have ended up winning the Civil War. With his wife being a former teacher, established the first White House Library, and they also started the policy of invited writers and performers to come to the White House. And she was the first First Lady to be involved in educational affairs. His wife died shortly after he left the presidency, and he remarried and came back to Buffalo. He felt his old house on Franklin Street wasn't presidential enough, so he ended up buying this mansion, which was on Niagara Square, in, uh, now in the location of where the Stadler Hotel was, there's now Stadler Towers. After he was president, he came back to Buffalo and he helped start many organizations here, such as the University of Buffalo, the Buffalo Medical Center, Historical Society, Albright Art Museum, the Science Museum, the SPCA, the Buffalo Club, enhanced the Buffalo Public Schools. Fillmore devoted his life to public service and establishing cultural, social, and educational institutions in Buffalo. He gets my vote for Buffalo's favorite son. St. John Newman was born in Bohemia, which is now part of the Czech Republic, and he was proclaimed the first male saint from the United States, and he ministered right here in Western New York. He was part Czech and part German, and he wanted to become a priest, but there was an overage of priests in Europe at that time. So they said, hey, why don't you go to America? Okay, so in 1836, Newman was ordained a priest at St. Patrick's in New York City, and he was sent to Western New York to minister to the German and other immigrants that lived in our area. And also because, well, he spoke eight languages and even learned Gaelic after the Irish started arriving in uh, the Western New York area. Well, instead of residing at St. Louis Church in downtown Buffalo, he went to St. Peter's and Paul in Williamsville but there wasn't a rectory. So he ended up staying in people's homes and he possibly had a room at the Eagle House on Main Street. In fact, I had a fish fry at the Eagle House last Friday and I saw this apparition coming down the stairs. I just went, that might've been St. John. No, I don't think it was, you know, but he did go over and offer a Buffalo brew, you know, so anyways. Well, anyways, he ended up serving an area that was all the way from Lake Ontario to Batavia to the Pennsylvania border. And he would travel, staying at people's homes and at taverns while visiting the sick, teaching or saying mass at kitchen tables. He was also the pastor of St. John the Baptist in North Bush, which is right down the street. North Bush is now Tonawanda. He stayed there until uh, 1840. Newman believed Catholics should be educated by Catholics. And when he was appointed Bishop of Philadelphia in 1852, he established the first Catholic school system in America and it was over 200 schools in uh, Philadelphia. He was canonized a saint in 1977, and as I said, he was the first male saint from the United States. Joseph Dart and Robert Dunbar were the inventors of the grain elevator. In 1842, Dart approached Dunbar because Dunbar had built water-powered flour mills right here in Black Rock. And so he ended up asking him to work with him on making a grain mill in the downtown Buffalo area. By manual labor, you could remove 2,000 bushels a day from a lake vessel. With their invention of uh, the grain mill, you could remove 2,000 bushels in one hour. So this invention ended up making Buffalo the grain mill capital of the world. Of course, everybody knows Joseph Dart he got all the name recognition, but truthfully Dunbar is the one that ended up making all the money because he involved and built grain mills all around the world. In fact, Jacob Shulikoff had the grain mills right here in the Black Rock area. Shulikoff arrived in the U.S. at 14. He didn't even speak English. He came to Buffalo in 1844 and he opened a leather shop. He made his money on the tanneries, but Shulikoff's business uh, idea was to invest in a business, make it successful, sell it, and then open another business. Okay, well, his work with the grain mills here in Black Rock expanded to doing more mills in Niagara Falls. 
That made him aware of the power of Niagara Falls, and he purchased the Niagara Falls Canal Company at a bankruptcy sale in 1877. By 1882, that was generating electricity. In fact, that ended up changing the way manufacturing and really life goes on today in the entire uh, country. Right down the street from where we are right now is where Steele McKay was born. Steele McKay is possibly one of the most important people in the theater industry. And you're probably saying, Steele McKay. Well, Steele McKay's father was Colonel McKay. He was a successful businessman working with William Fargo of Wells Fargo and American Express. And he also uh, helped build the telegraph industry with Samuel Morris. McKay was also involved in the anti-slavery movement. He was friends with Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Clay, and Abraham Lincoln. In fact, he ended up helping Lincoln write some document called the Emancipation Proclamation. So I guess his father was pretty cool also. Well, Steele was born in a home which was called the Castle on Niagara Street. It later became the Commandant's House at Fort Porter, which is near the current location of the Peace Bridge. And his mother was the sister of Oliver Steele, who was the first superintendent of schools in Buffalo. Well, Steele was interested in becoming an artist, as his cousin was the painter Homer Winslow. And he studied acting in Paris, and that ended up making him come back to the United States and open the first acting school in America called the American Academy of Dramatic Art, which is still in operation in New York City in Los Angeles. He ended up writing a play called Hazel Kirk, which was the longest running play ever on Broadway, and he coordinated the effects for the Wild Bill Wild West shows. He almost died in a fire in Brooklyn, and that was back in the days when uh, there were so many fires because of the uh, gas lighting and kerosene lighting. So he made many inventions, and he's better known for his inventions than his acting, and many of them were involved with fire safety. He invented the folding chair, okay, because that was done so that people wouldn't get stuck in aisles, fireproof curtains, fireproof scenery, the revolving stage, the double stage, and various other effects. His innovations changed theater as we know it today. Ebenezer Walden was Buffalo's first lawyer. He really wanted to come here to practice law. He ended up walking 40 miles from Batavia to get here. Well, when he got here, he found out, hey, there's not many people in Buffalo yet. You know, this is 1806. You know, so he ended up working various jobs, including being a clerk at little stores. When Buffalo was burned, he was one of the last to leave. He helped many of the people. In fact, uh, he tried helping Mrs. Uh, Lovejoy after she was uh, killed by uh, the Mohawks. He came back to Buffalo and he built a brick company, encouraging everyone to build with bricks. In fact, he built the first brick home after the War of 1812 at Maine and Eagle, which became the headquarters for General Winfred Scott. And he bought land in many, many different areas. He bought a bunch of land on the area near Fillmore and Walden, which was called Walden Farms. When they put a street through it, they named it Walden Avenue. So when you're driving to uh, the Galleria, just remember you're going down Walden. Oh, that's the guy that was the first attorney in Buffalo. He also owned the land that uh, he sold to uh, Lewis Allen to become a cemetery at Delaware and North. That's where the Lennox was built. And he also owned the land that became the Points at Barracks, which eventually became the Ansley Wilcox Mansion where Theodore Roosevelt was inaugurated. He was elected mayor of Buffalo in 1837. When he retired, he built a farm in Lakeview, which is basically now the entire hamlet of Lakeview. His daughter opened the Lakeview Hotel, which later became the Lakeview Schmorgasburg, which many people remember as one of the first places where you get Schmorgasburgs in Western New York. And she was married to a sort of an insignificant person, General Albert Meyer, who uh, lived here in Buffalo with her. He started the Army Signal Corps, which evolved into the National Weather Service. The one person that really is like the transition from early Buffalo to the later Buffalo is Captain Samuel Pratt and his entire family. They arrived in Buffalo in 1803, and they brought the first carriage to Buffalo. Their store and home were on the corner of Main and Exchange in the area that became the Mansion House. In fact, he owned a bridge going over uh, the Buffalo Creek leading to the South Towns. He had eight children. His son Hiram Pratt was later the mayor of uh, Buffalo. 
And he ended up building a mansion uh, called the Mansion on Prospect Hill, right down the street in the corner of Porter and Niagara, which is now the location of Duville College. That was later owned by Coe and Thompson. His son Samuel Pratt Jr. continued the family tradition of store ownership. And his sons were Samuel Fletcher Platt and Pascal Pioli Pratt. They built the legacy of the Pratt family. They ended up starting the uh, Pratt and Company retail hardware business, which extended all the way through the Mississippi. And in 1948, together with William Letchworth, the person that donated Letchworth State Park, right here in the Black Rock area, they ended up starting the Pratt and Letchworth Company which employed 1,800 people at their plant. Samuel was also the founder of the Buffalo Gaslight Company and the Buffalo Female Academy. Whereas Pascal was also the person that formed M&T Bank with Bromson Rumsey. The Rumsey family at one time owned 22 of the 43 acres of Buffalo. Interesting note, Pratt ancestors were the founding members of the Mormon Church. And the uh, two members of the family, Parley and Orson Pratt, were among the original 12 apostles. Parley was the spokesman for polygamy. Okay, he had 30 children. It's estimated today that he has between 30 and 50,000 living relatives. And he's the great-great-grandfather of Mid Romney. All right, so the Pratt family was really instrumental in starting manufacturing in Buffalo, what Buffalo ended up being known for. And they helped start a new tradition of wealthy families building mansions, especially along Delaware Avenue. Because you have to remember that during the late 1800s, Buffalo had 60 millionaires, more per capita than any other city in the United States. Well, this ends the early history of the Buffalo area, and I hope, you know, you enjoyed this discussion, and you'll hear my other talks about the second half of the book, when I talk about industry, mansions, religious leaders, the arts, the medical field, along with the contributions of females to the Western New York community. So I thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this talk, and I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you.